Welcome everybody here uh, to Ubiquity University's Great Books series. I know we have people from all over, both those people who are doctoral students of, Wis um, of Ubiquity and also people from last week's pilgrimage in the Dordogne as we were going in the footsteps of the sacred feminine and also people who are fascinated by Mary Magdalene across the world. So I'm so glad you're here. I think it's always fascinating, you know, when you walk the labyrinth, one of the instructions is to take everything that happens as a metaphor and as a symbol. And I think it's just so interesting that right now we had expected and hoped that Jim would be here to welcome you. And somehow through some strange glitch, he has been unable to enter in. And so the very person who was the root and the foundation of Ubiquity University has somehow gotten cut out. And in many ways, that is a little bit of the story that we're going to tell today as we talk about this fascinating book, The Gospel of the Beloved Companion, is that someone whose rightful voice and rightful place needed to be front and center was cut out of the picture. And that is the story that we're going to be tracing. And I'm going to hope and pray that Jim will be able to join in and will be able to hear his wonderful welcoming voice and his wise words um, and his deep heart. Those of you who know Jim know what an amazing teacher and being he is. But in the meantime, I am Dr. Kayleen Asbo, and it is my great joy to be sharing my fascination and passion for this particular story. I know that for some of you, you have been reading this. Some of you have been reading this for years and in fact have, have been in seminars with me on this very text. And others might just find this a new and peculiar and intriguing and fascinating story. I think it's really important to begin this discussion of this great book, and it is indeed a great book, with a couple of pieces of historical context, because we're all coming to this study from very different places, and I think there's a few really important things to know before we launch into the text itself. And I think the first thing to know is about it is the translator and the commentator, Jean de Quillon, who I met again for the second time, not very far from here at Mont Segur. Um, I was on a pilgrimage last year and tracing different pieces of research and we encountered each other in a little chapel, Notre Dame de Roc. And I've been in deep conversation with her over the past few months. And one of the things that she is so passionate about is she says, above all, above all, open your heart to take in this text. So today I'm going to be introducing this as a two-part series. And while I am equally fascinated as a historian of comparative religions and as a medieval historian and interested in culture, um, I also come at it as a mythologist I think that the most important part about this text, and I will be happy to speak to some of the historical elements, but it is indeed this very thing that Jean points us to, which is this idea that this is a book that can speak to our aching human hearts as we search for wisdom. It is a story that fills in many missing pieces, especially the missing pieces of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and is a piece that has come to light in our own times, almost like the concept of Buddhist terma teachings, that you know, in that great tradition, there are texts that are hidden away in caves for centuries until humanity is right to receive it. And in some ways, this might be thought of as a Western terma teaching as well. So I want to get us all on a similar page before we begin um, talking about the meat of this story, because the historical background is so critical for understanding its place as it arises. And whether you decide, it will be your choice, whether you decide to accept this text 
as authentic, as an authentic document that Mary Magdalene wrote in Greek and brought with her to France and was translated into the language of southern France, the Occitan language in the Middle Ages, and then has only been translated and revealed in our time in the past 10 years. Whether wow. you take that as historical accurate fact or whether you look at it as an inspired text What's that in is here. The question that Jean de Coulon puts so succinctly in this book is it really will be up to you whether you decide it is authentic, a medieval forgery, or a modern forgery. And that may be something that is a question for the historical intellectual of us. But I want to invite you into a space that whatever your decision about the historicity of this, that we be open to hearing the words of wisdom. So I'm going to start sharing my computer now to show a few slides here that will help us understand the context of this and the larger story that it is part of. For some of you, this may be review. For others, this may be very new information. But tomorrow is the feast day of Mary Magdalene. And so it is so appropriate that we talk about this story going forth into the week. And perhaps it will inspire some of you to read the book in its entirety if you haven't already, or to share it with friends, or to create your own Zoom celebration in honor of this most faithful disciple. And if we follow her historically, we can be assured by looking at simply the canonical texts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the biblical place of Mary Magdalene is indeed as the faithful witness, the disciple who was most true and faithful to Jesus, present for his suffering and death, named in all the accounts of the Gospels, and also the first witness. In the Gospel of John, she alone is the singular witness, while in the other Gospel accounts, there are other women who are with her at the tomb, but a very privileged place. In fact, that is why she inherited the original title of the Apostle to the Apostles, which could be translated as the Teacher of the Teachers. But I'm going to invite you to look at this image now on your screen. And you'll see that this is a very vivid artistic depiction about what happened over the first few centuries in early Christianity. If you look at this painting, which hangs in the Vatican Museum, you will see front and center the image of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child. And she surrounded here are various male saints. But if you actually take your finger, I encourage you to do this, and trace around to the left, you'll see that there's a part of the picture that's missing. And what, whatever you decide, whether it was deliberately cut out of the picture or it's simply waiting to be finished, something that was intended to be there is not there. And very much that embodies the experience of what has happened with the feminine and in particular, the feminine as represented by Mary Magdalene in the history of Christianity. Her rightful place has been taken away. She has been erased from the picture. Her voice was cut out across the centuries. And very quickly in the history of early Christianity, we know now, and there's wonderful works by Elaine Pagels and others on this, that originally early Christianity was a riot of possibilities of different perspectives on the meaning and the message and the teachings of this Jewish rabbi. And there were originally at one point hundreds, hundreds of texts about the teaching and the meaning and the message of Jesus. But after Emperor Constantine's conversion in the fourth century, those plethora, that enormous array of texts was reduced and confined to being four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know well that in 1945, a treasure trove of other texts was rediscovered in Egypt, in the so-called Nag Hammadi texts. And there have been others as well, including three copies of a text that we had no idea existed until the end of the 19th century. And that was the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now, 
in many ways, the different texts are from different perspectives, but in the decades that I have been studying this, I don't feel like they're contradictory so much, that their perspective of Mary Magdalene as the faithful witness to both suffering and joy, to crucifixion and resurrection, the most intimate connected one who was faithful and true to Jesus until his last breath is only, is only built upon in these other stories of Jesus where she is called the keeper of wisdom and the woman who knows more than all of her brethren and who has become the embodiment, the embodiment of Christ's teachings. So we know from historical legend and records that go back to the second century that according to tradition after the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection mary magdalene found her way here to the image that you see before you which is la bonne in southern france and provence and it was here that she adopted the life first as a teacher and a proclaimer of the message of jesus and then in her last few decades as a contemplative a deep contemplative and what this book purports to be, and it comes out of the Lacno tradition of Southern France, is that it actually purports to be the complete gospel of Mary Magdalene that Mary Magdalene brought with her from Alexandria to Southern France. And in fact, this was the teaching that was present in this region, in this Southern France region, which at the time was known as Occitania or we might say Aquitaine these days. And the Lacanau tradition then holds that this was a precious, precious document that was um, the, the foundation of the spiritual life of this region. And that in the Middle Ages, this text that we're about to explore, the Gospel of Mary, was translated from Alexandrian Greek into the language of Occitania, the Occitan language. And it was here then in the Middle Ages that there was this confluence of political and religious conflict that emerged at the dawn of the 13th century in Southern France. And there was the eruption all throughout Europe of so-called heresies. The Valdensians, the poor men of Lyons, the Bogomils, there are all kinds of heresies that were erupting all over Europe in response to what was perceived as the gross abuses of power and violence that were emergent in the Church of Rome. And one of the communities of people were known as the so-called Cathars. And indeed, to this day, if you go through much of southern France, particularly the Languedoc region, the language of Ock is what that word actually means, you will find sign after sign after sign that tells you that you are entering into Cathar territory. There is a fierce kind of nationalism in this area with its Occitan flag here that you see. And the version of Christianity that was taught here was in marked conflict and defiance, one might say, with the Church of Rome on so many points about, for example, going to war and the Southern French re would refuse to go um, on the Crusades. And most especially, they were at odds about the place of women. So at the dawn of the 13th century, there was a council of debates that was organized, and there were debates about um, the so-called heresies that were erupting in Southern France with the new order of preachers, OPs, that were known as the Dominicans. And since preaching didn't work, according to the Catholic Enc Encyclopedia, other methods were taken into play, and that it's one of the darkest chapters of all humanity, the so-called Albigensian Crusade, which began on the feast day of Mary Magdalene in the year 1209 in Béziers, France, in which all of the citizens of the town, both Cathars and Catholics alike, were locked in a cathedral and burnt alive. And for the next almost 40 years, then what happened was a wave after wave after wave of what historians have classified as the world's first genocide. And as you go throughout Southern France, you will see these monuments like this, the dove, uh, the Cathar Dove of Peace here in Béziers, where again on the feast day of Mary Magdalene, the citizens were round up and burned. 
And one of the biggest debates had to do with text. It was actually illegal to own a book, any Bible, in the vernacular language. Because it was said that this book that we're about to study was the very book that had been translated into the vernacular language that was a gospel that very, very close, closely parallels the Gospel of John. And the claim of the editor and translator of this is that this is the Urtext, um, the Urtext, the earliest gospel. We know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were born, were born to the world somewhere between two and three generations after the events that they depict. This book claims that it was the eyewitness account of the person who was closest to Jesus. And in the Albigensian Crusade, we know that the last event was here on the mountain of Montsegur, where the night before the burning of over 240 people, that there were a few people who escaped and had with them some priceless treasure. It is the claim of the Lacuno community that what the treasure was, was this book and that it was smuggled over the mountains, over the Pyrenees from France to Spain, where it was hid and preserved for safekeeping and where copies handwritten were passed down and where it was committed to oral memory and where only in the past 10 years amidst great controversy amongst the community was this text decided that it would be released to the world. And so this, this the author claims, is the great, great treasure of Montsegur. It is the holy grail, if you will, of the text. And we will be exploring then this story that it is said many people risked their lives and died for over the centuries as they took it along the route of the good men, the bonhommes, from France to Spain. And we will be sharing then this story as a matter of both historical fascination, but also a story which I think, and perhaps you agree with me, will pluck the strings of your heart and invite you to ask questions. One of the stories that one of the so-called logians of the so-called Gnostic Gospels, those which ones were banned and destroyed in the fourth century, but which have come to light again in 1945 in Mag Hammadi, there's a saying from the Gospel of Thomas of Seek until you find, and when you find, you shall be disturbed. And there may be parts of this story then that are disturbing to the the inherited images that we've had. And my deepest hope, and I imagine Jim's hope too, is that it will cause you to ask deeper questions, to explore more fully about what emerges here. And if we just take it as an image, a glimpse, a window, if you will, into another perspective of Christianity, that alone would be a rich and juicy discussion. So we'll turn now to our book, and I'm just going to check in with Rick and see, is, is Jim able to join us at all at this point? Yeah, Jim is here. He um, is. Wonderful. Yeah. And are we able then to find a way so that we can hear his beautiful voice? Yeah, I've just been asking him to join us. Ah, there he is. Come to light. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I've got... Uh, lost in the, the corridors of of uh, Zoom, and uh, I'm sure you've all had that experience one way or another. Uh, which it's actually a miracle that Zoom even works for the hundreds of millions of people that are using Zoom now every single day. And I just want to single out Rick first of all. Uh, Rick has been on Humanity Rising and Grammatica and. Uh, Kayleen's uh, pilgrimage to the Dordogne. So Rick, uh, how you're navigating Zoom on our behalf is, is, uh, is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> so I just wanna uh, thank and acknowledge Rick and, and uh, thank you all for your patience uh, uh, about Zoom. I just, uh, just to intercede uh, for a minute here before Kayleen uh, jumps in. Uh, you know, this, this issue of Mary Magdalene, I just wanted to make two comments. This issue of Mary Magdalene strikes to the heart of 
the decisions that were made by the early Christian church that ended up with an ecclesiastical structure that would engage in mass genocide of the believers of Mary Magdalene a thousand years later. And I'd like to just uh, dwell on that for a moment. As the church began to aggregate power, the forces of patriarchy, the forces of asceticism, the forces theologically around the negation of the body and the negation of women increasingly held sway. And what was buried in my view and in the view of many of the Dag, uh, Nag Hammadi texts and certainly the Gospel of the Beloved Companion was really the eroticism, the love of the body, the love of women, the love of life that Jesus of Nazareth embodied in a way that gave him the extraordinary vitality that he had that you find even in the gospel where he's called the friend of the publicans and sinners, a wine bibber. And um, many of the, the, the nuances at the edges of the story bespeak a man that we no longer remember but was actually there at the beginning, passionately in love with Mary Magdalene. Uh, and the love that they shared gave him the capacity to become who he was and Mary Magdalene to become who she became. There, and that was, by all accounts, as Kayleen said, the apostle to the apostles. She apparently was the only one that actually understood what Jesus was trying to really say. And the jealousies of the 12 male disciples, you can imagine if the woman and the lover of Jesus was the one who was closest to the, the disciple who Jesus loved and put her head on his bosom, in the earliest accounts, I'm sure, was not John, but um, Mary. And, you know, in a related point, uh, Andrew Harvey uh, uh, argues that it was both Mary Magdalene and the disciple John that Jesus loved. And that takes the whole issue of sexuality of Jesus and the whole notion of, of the eroticism of, of, of the man from Nazareth who for 2,000 years has towered over Western civilization into a whole new level of potency. And I would just point out that as Mary Magdalene has risen in our consciousness, so have the gays. So has the explosion of gender. And I think it's just worth contemplating um, uh, the, 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 the earliest story um, and how different it must have been uh, in reality. And that brings me just quickly to the second point that I want to make, and that is that When we think of, of the future of the church, we think of the future of spirituality, first and foremost, it needs to be embodied. I think one of the most extraordinary things that Mary Magdalene has taught me as I've studied her over the years was the fierceness of her embodiment, the scandal of her embodiment the boldness with which she passionately loved Jesus. And there is a little story from uh, Nikos Katsanzakis, if you have read his great masterwork, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ. 
And the last temptation of Christ was, do I go on the cross? Or do I go with Mary Magdalene? And he tells a story that's worth just putting in here, just for the, 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 the conversation. He says that when they were around 12 years old, Mary Magdalene and Jesus met and they fell in love. And they went into a cornfield and they lay down in the ground on their backs with their feet touching. And when their feet touched, they went into the ecstasy of union that was so powerful that it changed their lives. And they, in his story, they never consummated again. And that was what motivated Jesus tore at the heart of Jesus, consternated Jesus until finally going to the cross, the one thing he had not done that he wanted to do more than anything else in the world. He wanted to make love with Mary Magdalene. <laughs> so I just offer this, this story of, 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 uh, uh, of embodiment and, and Nikos Katsanzakis and the last temptation of of Christ, because I think if if there's a Christology that goes to the heart of the complexity of the man Jesus, it's Katzenzakis's last temptation of Christ. So that I just wanted to offer that out um, as a companion volume to the Gospel of uh, 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 the uh, Beloved Companion as another book that one of you may want to take up from time to time because it's very, very powerful. So this is, this is a hugely powerful story that was repressed and now is coming back in our time, I believe, for very profound reasons that we'll now uh, hear from Kayleen are buried in this sacred text that was so preciously preserved uh, by people um, who knew of its importance. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Kayleen, I turn the uh, floor back to you. Take the story from here. <laughs> okay. I'll just say one thing in response to what you've, what you've shared, which is certainly there is a deep hunger in our world for unification, that we have had this split between the body and the soul and the mind and the heart, and that from so many people that has caused enormous anguish and the sensual and the spiritual as if they are two separate things. And we see expressed in so many novels that are out there, not just that one, but the expected one, the Da Vinci Code, many, many others of these novels that have seen, have you have really believed in hope that Mary Magdalene was a bridge between worlds. Um, I do want to be clear that that this text here is not, you know, it is not claiming to be a work of fiction. This is a work that is utterly precious as a nonfiction work. And the role that Mary Magdalene has in this text is on the one hand, yes, she is the wife of Yeshua. They use the ancient Greek, uh, the ancient Hebrew term for Jesus here, Yeshua. But it's her role as the wisdom keeper, as the one who understood his message better than any other, as the tower of wisdom. And that is what is most important about her, is her insight, her amazing spiritual maturity, the fact that she is the one who has risen to wear his mantle. And so a few pieces about this, you know, those of you who are widely read in what are sometimes called the other gospels, um, I would, and if you're curious about this, I would point you to um, a new New Testament edited by Hal Tausig. And for those of you who have followed the gospel of Mary, you will know here that one of the most tantalizing things about it is that it's in fragments. We just have little pieces, although there are three copies of it. It actually is a text that's interrupted and the most important primary teaching is missing. And you get, you start reading it and here comes this great revelation and then it's gone. 
And this is what is in this text is, it is a, a very holistic, it's a very holistic text. So much of it parallels the Gospel of John. You'll have the same sort of stories. You'll have John the Baptist. You'll have lines that you read that you may have known from Sunday school as a child. And then you'll come to teachings that are woven in that also include these non-canonical works. So for example, it has the Gospel of Thomas, which if you read in its form from Nag Hammadi is sort of like the, the notes, the class notes. They are simply sayings and logians um, about bring forth what is inside you and what is inside you will save you, for example. But there's no narrative framework. There's no context there. This book is one story from beginning to end, from the beginning of Jesus's ministry to the last revelation, which is actually culminates in chapter 42, with the missing parts of the Gospel of Mary. So it's woven together that we have these sayings from the non-canonical text, the wisdom texts of Jesus, and we have the cohesive narrative of the Gospel of John, of his teachings, his preachings, his crucifixion, the appearance to Mary in the garden, and then following that, this profound revelation. So it's an incredible synthesis and there are a few parts then that I think are important to look at and to think about when you're asking the question of what gets us closer. What gets us closer to the real man who walked the seas of Galilee, who taught and preached and healed and his message? And one of the things that's so exciting for people who are interested in the history of early Christianity is that when we get texts like the Nag Hammadi text, like the Gospel of Thomas, they haven't been redacted and changed over centuries upon centuries upon centuries. They're sort of frozen in time in the fourth century. And one of the fascinating and troubling things about doing biblical scholarship is when you compare different versions, how easily they change and how easily things get translated. And one of the biggest things to think about is the presence of the feminine. And so, for example, when Jesus would be speaking in Hebrew or he would be talking in Aramaic, his language, the word for Holy Spirit in both languages is gendered feminine. So when Jesus was speaking and he would talk about Holy Spirit, he would always use the pronoun she. Well, when, that, when his words in Aramaic and Hebrew got written down in Greek, the word for Holy Spirit is neuter, gender neuter. But when it got translated by Jerome and others into Latin, there was a gender change and Holy Spirit became masculine. So that the Trinity that Jesus would have been talking about, the Father and himself mm -hmm. as the Son and the Holy Spirit, it would have had a very different feeling just simply with that pronoun. And so from that perspective, this book is much closer <laughs> to Jesus because whenever it talks about Holy Spirit, it always, always, always uses the pronoun she. So for example, in page 65, Jesus says, my words are given of the spirit and no one comes to the kingdom except through her teachings. And I just want to invite you here in the chat, maybe you've had this experience, but that those of you who've had just that experience, I've been lucky enough to be in a few Celtic Christian and Episcopalian churches where the priest has decided to correct this error in the translated languages. And when saying the creed, the Nicene Creed, they say she. But just what would that have done? What would that have done to your imagination to think of that and to know that that was the gender that Jesus was speaking of? It can be an enormous change, an enormous change. 
And the idea, Cynthia Bougeau makes this point in her book, The Meaning of Mary Magdalene, in which the Franciscan uh, Richard Rohr has quoted today on his daily post. He's dedicating the entire week to Mary Magdalene. And he actually has this wonderful image that he has from this magnificent um, artist named Janet McKenzie. I encourage you to Google Janet McKenzie and her work, which is a dark-skinned Jesus and a dark-skinned Mary Magdalene and co-teaching side by side. And in this text, when it's talking about his message and it's the Last Supper and the, the disciples are afraid and they are afraid, what is going to happen to us when you are gone? There is the most beautiful, beautiful teaching in here about this co-relationship that she is actually his spiritual heir. And this is chapter 35, verse 16. The disciples asked Yeshua, when, when will you depart for us? And who is to be our leader? And Yeshua says, I will not leave you orphans. For when a father goes away, it is the mother who tends the children. So I'm just going to invite you to consider, you know, what does that do to our imagining to imagine two two beings of profound wisdom side by side and that the one who stands at the foot of the cross watching the suffering was also the one who sat at his feet imbibing his teachings and his words and who managed to in her heart take them in in their fullness and not just be a listener to them and not just a teacher but to become the living embodiment of those teachings so this book is a map, it's a map of consciousness, a map of wisdom, a map of what it is to wrestle with the things that are inside of us in our inwardly, and then to confront those. You know, it's so Jungian. Carl Jung absolutely adored what he believed were the, the early Christian Gnostics. He said those were the world's first depth psychologists. They understood about what it was to wrestle with things inside. And then, having mastered our own, whether you call it our inner ego, John de Quillon, the translator of this, says that's what's meant by this phrase, the master of this world, is the ensnarement of the ego. And what is it to awaken into consciousness? And the idea of side-by-side -side master, student, teacher, couple, loved ones who become the father and mothers to birth a sense of spiritual awakening in their community. That is such the heart of this text, such the heart of this text. So I'm aware of the fact that we are about halfway through, which I'm told is when it's time to start engaging discussions about this. Before we get, turn to that in just a moment, I'm just gonna invite you to start thinking about some of these things. Maybe put in your chat, in the chat box, what does simply changing the gender, how does that affect you? To go back to the early Christians who would have been talking about ruah, the breath, the Holy Spirit, and the Aramaic word for Holy Spirit and have that spoken about in the feminine. That alone is so significant and so parallel with what we know historically from the early days. Now, the question about the Gospel of John is a fascinating historical question here because there has been so much debate across the centuries who wrote the Gospel of John, who is the beloved companion, who is the beloved disciple that Jesus says is the one that he loves. And we have had different candidates across time. There is certainly the candidate of John, who was associated with Revelation. But there are other people who suggested that it was Lazarus. And going back to the early centuries, some of the early fathers, I think it was Irenaeus of Lyon, second century, um, third century in France, believed that that also was Mary Magdalene. And there has been a rising tide of scholarship before this book appeared from places ranging from the Netherlands to UC Berkeley, where so many of the authors of biblical scholarship who focused on Yoenite Christianity 
really believe that John was so different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that those have this other flavor, but John was more the mystical and the cosmological and saturated with images that are redolent of the Song of Songs with the appearance in the garden, the garden and the lilies. And so if we hold that, that indeed John and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion somehow trace their way back to a similar source, that's a fascinating journey to go on. And I invite you to, do, to go on that journey yourself. The last part of this book is actually looking at comparisons between the two, between the Gospel of John and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, the so-called Gnostic texts and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. And that those two things could coexist in one whole, I think is something that for many readers is just, um, it strikes their hearts so deeply that you could have that fourth mystical text that's in the Bible, but also have these wisdom teachings that were passed on to the inner circle, the so-called Gnostic texts, interwoven into a cohesive narrative in which the relationships also reflect a much deeper first century understanding of Judaism. For example, some of the details in this text about the funereal rites are so specific about what would have been the custom in Jewish families that it feels very much like it was said, like it was written by someone who was there rather than the text that we have of the Gospel of John, which many people date to the year 100 or 110, a late text that happened generations after Jesus. There's an intimacy, a familiarity that is so profound. So this is something to really hold. What would it be like to go back to what seems to have been an early version of Jesus not just male, 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 but a family of father, mother. I see in the chat remarks by Mary Sue O'Reilly. Yes, absolutely. In, Mar in the Aramaic Lord's Prayer that Neil Douglas Klotz has done such work on, the word which we have translated is our father could have been our father, mother, or O oh, thou, or O oh, birther of the universe. There's a plethora of choices of what abwun de bashamaya, nekadesh tak te te malkatak could actually mean. Those Aramaic words have so many possibilities. But we telescope, just like we cut out all of those other stories, other texts of Jesus to just the four. We took all the possibilities of his own language and we reduced it to the masculine. So if nothing else, I think this book is an invitation to engage the canonical texts in a deep, authentic wrestling with the importance of language, the importance of translation, and the importance of what was cut out of the story. And what does it do to us if we reclaim those pieces? We have a wholer image of a human family. And that's very different than the story of the man who was lost, betrayed, and abandoned, suffering in agony alone. As Cynthia Bougeau says, as this book does, he wasn't alone. Even our Bible tells us he's not alone. Mary is at the foot of the cross, breathing with him every breath, every breath of suffering. Eyes looking at him with love, arms cradling his body as it comes down from the cross, tears bathing his feet. That this is an embodied love, and it's an embodied love that calls us in our time of suffering and sorrow into a deeper wholeness. So let me turn back to our beloved founder, Jim, where would we like to go with this discussion now? Hmm. Well, thank you, Kayleen. I just want to commend you, first of all, uh, especially your last remarks were so passionately delivered uh, and so profoundly true. Um, you know, the cutting out of Mary Magdalene cut out the heart of Christianity and it condemned Christianity to become one of the most violent religions in the history of the world. And um, we need to reclaim it. And we need to uh, re-embrace Mary Magdalene in her rightful uh, position. Uh, so 
Uh, well, everyone, uh, you know the drill. We'd like to hear from uh, all the, the students uh, to uh, uh, put your hands up. And um, because I was uh, elevated, I don't have a, a way of seeing um, who, um, Oh, there we go. I can. I, yeah. So, if, if the the doctoral students, uh, part of the requirements of the course is that you uh, interact. So, I want to uh, encourage everybody to raise their hand. Uh, Margot Bordin, uh, good. Thank you, Margot. Uh, and then Crystal Steinberg. We'll start with the two of you, um, and then we'll uh, uh, have uh, comments from others. So, uh, Margot, and then Crystal. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, so uh, I, I grew up really with, uh, I would say, no exposure to religion until discovering autobiography of a yogi when I was 15. So I have, this is my first time, apart from, you know, a couple movies uh, delving into the world of uh, the West. And um, so I started to read uh, the, the book and it, it didn't mean anything to me. So then I started to watch some videos and try to build some context uh, so I could understand what this was all about because I had no background history or um, understanding a lot of the words I had to look up in the dictionary. And um, is there a, a sort of a, a book that you would recommend uh, to... Uh, yeah, for people like me or just people who want to get the big overview before diving into the depths of, of this book, which I'm starting to understand the beauty and the meaning of. Well, there's, it depends on which, um, which direction you might want to go with this. Uh, one thing that I think can be a helpful background that is a summary is, is actually there is a, a program called 22 Days of Magdalene Emerging that begins on July 23rd again. And this is sort of the summary of the different, it begins with the summary of Mary Magdalene and Jesus as seen through the canonical texts and then turns to the Gnostic texts and then turns to history so that it kind of lays a background for that. Um, the, um, I think if you're interested in the historical piece, the place that I like to have everybody start from a historical perspective is to read the, um, read the book by Elaine Pagels on the Gnostic Gospels. Even though this particular book isn't that, um, it's not mentioned, it wasn't discovered, it wasn't translated by that time. It speaks to the larger issues of what happened and Elaine Pagels is a quite accessible author. And so what happened in the tensions, particularly the tensions between Mary and Peter, who represented what eventually coalesced as the orthodox position. These tensions between a hierarchical model of authoritarian rule and the tension that emerged from the other perspective, the Magdalenian perspective of Jesus' teachings really being about inner awakening and enlightenment and how there was the clash of these two very different perspectives over time and what ended up happening as the Magdalenian line, the so-called Gnostic line or the, the diverse line of many Christianities got cut off one by one by one by one to submit to a very hierarchical authoritarian rule underneath the Roman emperor. So that's a good foundation background text, I think, to understanding some of this. Thank you. Crystal? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, Margo. I'm coming from uh, uh, like the complete opposite end of the spectrum because I'm somebody who was raised in the Protestant tradition from the ultra conservative Lutheran church where um, I was the superintendent of Sunday school but couldn't sit on the board of education because I was female. 
and was teaching my students that there were more than one versions of, for instance, the Noah Ark story and talking about different writers uh, who had been redacted and then moving into the more moderate group and really learning about God being loved from a pastor and his wife who was asked to excommunicate his gay son to the most liberal of um, the Protestant churches where I found myself eventually with no intention of moving there for this, but in seminary and serving as a parish pastor where I really learned the limitations of doctrine and um, how it got in the way of people living the word. And in reading this text, I find so much hope mm -hmm. for a bridge from where we are now in the world and what we're doing with humanity rising to cosmic consciousness. Um, it really takes me from a place of hopelessness regarding Christianity to being hopeful. And so I am just so grateful mm. for this exposure and am really seeing this as a gift to the world today. Um, at this particular point in time with the pandemic, I really see this as a bridge. And so thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing that. You know, that has been my experience of so many people that, that I have worked with, um, people who feel wounded um, by Christianity in many cases who, or who have given up. And yet then they find this text and, and often, I'm so curious what uh, some of the other students and listeners think, but I've had many people report to me like this is the first time where the narrative made sense, where I could feel a deep sense of connection and kinship. There's a little detail that's lovely. When one of the disciples is, is struggling uh, with some of the ideas, there's a, a little moment where it says, Jesus smiled. And just to think of that, to think of mm -hmm. Jesus smiling is changes so much of the emphasis of what we've had on suffering and torture and death that has been yeah. brought to us. And, you know, the image is so important. You know, another one of the, the lines in this text that was also in Thomas is, you know, the disciples asking, when will the kingdom appear? And he says, when you make an image to replace an image mm -hmm. and the power of images. And if you know through your studies of art history that the image of a suffering bloody Christ with the crown of thorns, dripping blood, emaciated, being tormented with nails, became the dominant image in the year 1000. But that was not the first image. Yes. First images was the divine child, the nurturing mother, the healer, the teacher with the book of wisdom. There was the good shepherd who actually had a harp on his lap. That's in the catacombs. Mm -hmm. Jesus, the musician who's bringing harmony through song to the world and if you have that as your dominant image or the flower of life what a difference what a difference and this image of him suffering dying and being betrayed versus being held tenderly in the bosom of his family who loved him it's such a different image mm -hmm. the closest thing I've I've seen would be Mike Iaconelli's A Childlike Wonder and he opens it up with Jesus having a mud fight with the disciples in the sea. <laughs> um, it'd be the, just that humaneness, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that all of the debates, we think about all of those raging debates that people died for as they argued from the, the end of the third century onwards. Is he divine or is he human or is he both? And all the amount of blood that was shed over that kind of question and the horrors that that unfolded if you had a different answer, you know, and both sides of the debate, you know, the horrors yes. that were unleashed and how far that takes us away from this man whose message is always wake up, wake up, awaken now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're waking up. <laughs> I hope so. 
You know, it's uh, before we move on, uh, thank you so much, Crystal. It's worth <clears throat> another book that I would recommend everyone uh, is actually a chapter in uh, Dostoevsky's uh, great work. Um, uh, not Crime and Punishment, the Brothers Karamazov. And one of the chapters is called The Grand Inquisitor. And uh, Jesus shows up not long after the great uh, genocide of the Cathars. And uh, the uh, bishop immediately puts him in prison. <laughs> and there's this dialogue where the bishop can't resist going down into the cell. Jesus never says a word, and the bishop just keeps talking, trying to defend what the church has become, and basically said, listen, man, you offered people freedom. They didn't want freedom. You affirmed their vitality, but that's not what people want. We know what people want. And he gives this amazing backward logic for the distortions of the church over a series of nights where Jesus just stands there in complete serene <laughs> silence. And then at the end, um, Jesus just disappears. But it's a, a to your point, Crystal, of, of the, and Kayleen, of the agonies of the church in the negation of what Jesus truly represented and, and how violently then you, they had to repress that eroticism that just naturally life wants to express uh, is at the heart of, of how Christianity became so distorted at the hands of, of the patriarchal order. And the, if you think about the history of this, that the crusade and the inquisition what that these are all contemporaneous with this this teaching and that it became punishable by burning if you owned a bible in your own language for hundreds of years i mean people don't really realize this historical piece but from the dawn of the 13th century until after the protestant reformation if you owned a bible in your own language you could be drawn and quartered or burned at the stake because this was not the, the the average human being wasn't trusted their own heart wasn't trusted that their intuition their intuitive capacity to connect a relationship with the divine had to be subjugated to authoritarian structures of being taught what to believe and what to say and what to do and the whole point of this text and the other texts that were recovered in Nagmadi is that you need to awaken your inner wisdom. And it's a long and hard journey. It's not an easy journey that we're on to do this. But the personal responsibility for awakening our own consciousness. And I, I suspect that's one reason why this text is so important and emerging for our time. Some of the comments in the chat box right now about, you know, how do you discern truth? This is a fundamental question from early Christianity. Do you believe in something because an authority figure has told you and they are in a lineage of telling you? Or do you believe that something is true because inside everything in your being vibrates and says, yes, this is the truth to follow. This is what I know in my heart in its depth. And this would be a book that would say in answer to that question, Look inside your own heart and see, is it true or not? Don't take anybody's word for it. Find the still small voice inside of you. But how dangerous it was thought to listen for that still small voice. I mean, another piece of the chapter of the tragedies of religion is the so-called sin of quietism. You know, where people were suspicious that if you sat quietly in prayer and meditation, that what would emerge would be demons and voice of the devil. Or I've even heard people say this about walking the labyrinth, you know, that you can't do walk the labyrinth because, because what? Because it will lead you into your own heart. It will lead you into your own experience. Big important questions for our time. Mm -hmm. Katina, and then Rachel Root, and then... Uh, Angie. 
Katina? Can you hear me now? There we go. There we go. Hi, thank you so much. Um, first of all, it's such an honor to be here with you, Jim and Kayleen, because I've been watching you and um, the previous recordings and, and getting on Humanity Rising whenever I have a chance. Um, are you Kat? Katina. Katina, are you, are you the one on Humanity Rising that does these stenographer uh, summaries? No. Oh, okay, good. Because there's somebody <laughs> named Kat. I thought maybe that was you that has been doing this amazing chronicling of humanity rising. So anyway, but keep going. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So anyway, I am coming from a, a very different, I guess not too much different than the pre previous student that spoke, but I was raised in Catholic school. And I went to Catholic school from kindergarten through seventh grade. I have, um, I didn't realize I have a pretty interesting story until as I um, became an adult. So everything that you're saying, Kayleen, is just so beautiful and resonating with me. And when I saw that this book was part of this class, I was so excited to read this because the first time that I heard of Mary Magdalene, I was in, be, before middle school, I know that, obviously because I, I was there till seventh grade. But it was not, unfortunately, okay, so there's, my experience growing up in, in Catholic school, there's always a positive and a negative, correct? So it disciplined me to be grateful, disciplined me to be humble, and, but it also showed me that there were so many rules. And I realized when I was old, when, as I became an adult, actually probably a year ago, that I had religious trauma. Because everything was a sin. Everything, if, if you take the bread before you do your first communion, it's a sin. If you don't do your confirmation before you have, get married, it's a sin. If you have sex before marriage, it's a sin. And you're going to hell. All of this, you're going to hell. So I grew up thinking I was going to hell. And I didn't really realize this, but it was, a, it was a trauma. It was something inside of me that I had to heal. I was a teen mother. I became a mother at the age of 14, like our Virgin Mary. And I have three children. My, all of my children were born on holidays to include myself and my baby when I was 21 was born on Christmas day. Now, when I was 14, I went to the priest and because I still uh, religiously still go to church, I just go to a non-denominational, very uh, different type of church now. But I was in Catholic church up until about nine years ago. And when I was 14, I went up to the priest and I said, you know, can you please, you know, um, pray on me and my baby? Because, you know, I had, I am, I had sex out of, you know, wedlock. I have, I'm having a child. And, you know, I just want you to bless us. And he's like my child, you know, he basically told me, Jesus loves everyone. Don't worry, you are forgiven. You're not going to hell. Your child is not going to hell. And, um, and it was, I'll never forget that. And from that day, I was just like, wow, because we were brought up to, to believe that the priests spoke for Jesus. So back to Mary Magdalene. The first time I heard of her was in John 8, 7, where uh, there's a quote in the Bible that says, those who do not sin, who have not sinned, throw the first stone. And I remember learning about this verse and I visualized it. I don't remember if we saw a movie on it or saw videos on it, but I remember an, a vision of this woman being stoned and rocks being thrown at her. And Jesus comes to save her and says that very verse, those, you know, all of you stop, those who, who have, those of you who have never sinned, you throw that first rock and no one threw a rock because we are all sinners. So it really, Mary Magdalene 
growing up in Catholic school was known to be this woman who was a prostitute, who was not respected, who was beneath a woman that we would ever want to be. And I honestly felt a closeness to her because of the decisions I made and, you know, I started rebelling. It was, I started going through an avenue where I felt closeness through Mary Magdalene. And that's what taught me the unconditional love of Jesus is that he is, is very well, as much as he loves the sinners, he, he, as much as he loves them, which we, we all have something, but, uh, that's what he's here for is the sinners. And then when people make comments like, Oh, you know, you, you did, you, you need Jesus. You need to go to church. Well, you know what? We, we all need some type of higher power to believe in, to forgive ourselves, to forgive the trauma. Number one, forgiving ourselves, because that's where I realized that I lived with so much guilt and shame that I felt so unworthy. I went into unhealthy relationships. I just felt like I didn't, I was not deserving of respect. So when I realized the opposite of that, and when I started learning and, and reading and educating myself and, and spiritually just awakening, um, I realized that you know, that, that, that's not true, that it, it, the, the, I started really learning about the feminine and masculine side of us and balance and how we, you know, we do have that voice. Although the way that I was raised in Catholic school, it was like, you know, there were no female priests. The, the females were nuns and they were, it's really sad for me to say this because I remember they were beneath the priest. They were, it was as if they bowed down to the priests. Uh, always, it was a respect form, but I remember them seeing like father, you know, and they weren't in front of us abusive. Or, or, yes. Patina, maybe you could just uh, uh, summarize or bring it. We have uh, about a half a dozen other people that need to speak. In the oh next, my gosh. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah. just quickly. So that's my, that's my spiel. I can go on and on, but just about about a year ago is where I, I realized I did have the religious trauma and Mary Magdalene. I, I I did like you said how Mary was crying at his feet. I did remember and see that scene, and um, I think I healed and and pushed through some religious trauma thanks to her and that story. I don't know if I, I'm sorry if I spoke too much, but this is a very exciting topic for me. <laughs> feel the healing that's happening inside of you as you find the integration. That's something that's been such an important thread for so many readers of this book. Yes, oh my gosh, amazing. Well, and it's amazing too, uh, Katina, you're bringing up this whole issue that is so pervasive in Christianity um, of just trauma. I, I was the son of missionaries in, in, in Taiwan and West China. And the traumas I endured were almost unspeakable. And the fact that you were kind of redeemed um, through Mary Magdalene uh, is a powerful testament to her recurrence uh, in our time. And it's just worth noting, everyone, that when I came into what is now Ubiquity University, um, I dedicated my tenure as president back in 2005 when I started to Mary Magdalene uh, and the Black Madonna. So the Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonna have been very precious to me. I'm happy to be tonight uh, here in Chartres in France. And Mary Magdalene is depicted in a number of um, uh, areas of the cathedral. There's a whole stained glass window uh, to Mary Magdalene, one of my favorite windows. Um, and so what Katina is talking about in terms of trauma and its trans Thank you.
Okay, we've got Rachel and then Angie and then Katie. And uh, we've only got a few minutes left. So if we can be as concise as possible, that would be um, helpful. Rachel? Okay, I think I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I too was raised uh, with Christianity. What I devoured this book. I devoured it. I loved it. Um, what, what I loved doing <clears throat> was taking the differences between the scripture, the, can, the canonical accepted scriptures, and what was in the book, what was different about that. And for me, it was extraordinary journey because it gave me so many um, uh, answers, fill-ins for things that I could not understand uh, completely at all, which it illumined, it highlighted for me. So I loved it. Um, I wondered if you would just address the part about the tree and the branches. I love that. I'm intrigued. My favorite part that our whole part two class on August 11th is about that chapter. Oh, okay. 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 Well, because it needs a you. whole class just for itself. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that was my huge driving question. So thank you. As, as Beth just said, yes, the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned, everyone. Uh, Kayleen, we'll get to the tree next time. Uh, Angie. Welcome, Angie. Hi, Jim. How are you? All right. <laughs> so I didn't grow up with uh, religion or church. Um, and so for me they always felt very scary i don't know why anytime somebody would get married or somebody a friend would invite me to come to church with them and i would walk into these places i would feel very heavy like like i couldn't breathe or something and this is from the time i was really little and still to this day i don't feel welcomed there so if if i could hear she maybe that would make me feel a little more like i had space um, the question I had for, uh, Kayleen is I noticed that there are, you know, 12 got our disciples. And again, I don't know much about the church, so I, I could be just completely, um, inaccurate here, but, um, why are they all men? Is there a reason why there weren't other women besides yeah. Magdalene? Yeah. And what do the, um, or is, is there anything about these disciples' wives or daughters, or, or is anything written about them? Mm. Thank you for that question. Yes, we have inherited a tradition that says that there were 12 disciples and that that has become our image. But uh, if you look in the Nag Hammadi text, you'll find that there are actually are others, including women, in addition to Mary Magdalene. Uh, there is her sister, Martha, who is a very powerful leader of the early Christian church, who also traveled to France. Very powerful. The image of Martha actually in France is of her taming a dragon, of holding a dragon on a leash. And if you think about that as an archetypal symbol, isn't that powerful and intense? It's wonderful I love image. That. And then there was a disciple that was named as Salome, and we actually have the first reference to her is in the Gospel of Mark, where she's one of the faithful women who's present with Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, but she got written out of the story completely. She's fascinating, Salome. And in this story, we have two Salomes. We have Jesus's sister, Salome, and then we have the woman at the well, who's another Salome. So that's fascinating. So there were, in fact, other women, students of Jesus, women followers of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke says, you know, one of the references to Mary Magdalene is, and Mary Magdalene and other women who, who helped Jesus' ministry out of their own means. So there were women, some of them wealthy, who were traveling with the disciples that we know about. But the gradual cutting out of that, um, if you go to my website, there is uh, some, mail, uh, some uh, 
recommended reading. I have to tell you, the, re the reading will get you upset. <laughs> the more you read about what happened to women throughout the history of Christianity, it's really hard to read that alone. It is so frustrating. You know, Jane Schauberg's book, for example, of the resurrection of Mary Magdalene, um, there are so many things that are painful about how women got literally cut out of the picture. Sometimes their names, like one of the companions of Paul, a couple centuries later, they did a name change so that her name Unia became Unias. So she had a name change from feminine to masculine. Um, so much damage and erasure has happened. And thank God we live in a time where this is coming to light and finally being restored. And mm. Kaylee, one more question. Why do you think men did this? Why would they want to write the feminine out? Oh, we need a whole other webinar for that. <laughs> yeah, I want to know that fear, fear is part of it, and control. I think those two things, you know, much easier to control and and it money. Was a different cultures too. It was a if you it, if you insist that your priests now become celibate, and that all the money go to the church. Well, that's a history that's been writ large in the history of religion. Thank you. A great question, Angie. Great question. It's worth pointing out, just by the way, everyone, that this also happened to the family of Jesus. The, the, it was clear that Jesus had brothers and sisters, yes. which means that Mary, the virgin mother, had Jesus, and then she and Joseph had sex uh, a number of more times <laughs> uh, to uh, procreate. Um, uh, but the storyline of Jesus was that he was the only, and it was the Immaculate Conception, and Jesus, Mary was a virgin, so obviously she couldn't have sex. So uh, there's a famous story, actually, where the, 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 uh, the, the descendants of Jesus went to the church, um, uh, I think it was in the third century, um, asking that they help them because we're the family of Jesus, and they were completely turned away. And the, the, the family of Jesus also disappeared in history. So it wasn't, it wasn't just the women. It, there was a, as Kayleen is saying, there was a very specific storyline that the, 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 the consolidating power structure of the church needed to cultivate and sculpt. And anything else that didn't fit into that uh, storyline, um, maybe Rachel can mute, um, you know, was, was basically um, uh, a cut out. Uh, and um, again, as Kayleen said, and it was done with much blood, there, this was not a, uh, a friendly conversation. This was a conversation that ultimately was about the acquisition of power, because at the end of the day, the church had consolidated complete power over the remains of the Roman Empire and held it for nearly a thousand years. Next, we've got um, uh, Katie, no, Rachel Root, and then Katie uh, Weiner, and that's that's probably all we have. We have about seven minutes left. So again, brevity is the better part of valor here. Rachel's uh, mic's open, Jim. I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm muting myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to mute myself. Go ahead. So is Janice there or Michelle Sinet? I'm, I'm Janice is here. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Janet. Hi, Jim. First of all, I want to thank you for the choice of both of the books, <clears throat> the, the uh, Beloved Companion and Joe Dispenza. I'm having a wonderful time relating these two. Um, quickly, I have experienced the trauma that a lot of people have spoken of because half my family mm -hmm. is evangelical and half Jewish. And so the suppression of women um, had is a big 
issue for me from early childhood. So I love going through this text and having it come alive because I've actually set that portion aside in my life and not really paid attention to it. It was so distressing to me. So to have a text that is written in narrative style, contextualized in a, such a beautiful way, um, really speaks well to me. And Kayleen, I've just loved the um, pilgrimage and I will go on yet another with you. And <clears throat> your, expo your exposition is just so beautiful, so amazing. And out of interest, the only person in my past that related to the Holy Spirit as feminine was Marion Woodwin, Marian Woodman in some of the readings. Now it's making sense to me. Now I get why she did that. Um, the question that I have two questions. And one, are there any Jewish authors writing about Mary Magdalene? Contemporary Jewish authors. Um, you might check out uh, Mirabai Starr is of Jewish background, and I think she's begun to address Mary Magdalene more recently. She's done fabulous work on other women mystics, but I yeah. love Mirabai. She's wonderful. I, uh, I love her too, Kaylee. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, for a great author to try. I have a further question. Um, the original, say they talk about the text being Greek and then translated into the other languages. Mm -hmm. um, is there any in Aramaic or Hebrew in the original, or was that just a, a verbal or no, tradition? Yeah, and, and you know, it's consonant with the New Testament, where the New Testament was also written in Greek, and Alexandria was the first center of Christianity and Christian scholarship, Christian catechesis is the phrase that they use to describe it. So no, yeah, we, we don't have Jesus in Aramaic, although um, Syriac is the closest to Aramaic and the Gospel of Mary, one copy of that is in Syriac. Oh, that's so interesting. Thank you, Kayleen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll just let somebody else speak. I could say more, but I will stop. See you for the next pilgrimage. Look forward to it. Me too. Thank you, Janice. Those are great questions. You know, Jesus was one of those um, spiritual leaders that never wrote anything. Mm -hmm. He just spoke, he just lived, and his life was his book. Uh, and so as a result, there was nothing written. Everything was an oral tradition, and it was not, you know, until, you know, 50, 60 years later that the, the Gospels as we know them, um, you know, began to uh, take shape out of different communities of, of believers um, that had different orientations. Um, as uh, Kayleen uh, indicated. Uh, we're just at the end of the, of the time, so I think uh, we will bring it to a close. Uh, but um, Kayleen, do you have any final words you want to leave uh, with anything you want to say about the next uh, session? Sure, I do. Um, we will, on August 11th, really be focusing exclusively on Chapter 42 and the Tree of Life. And I would encourage those of you who do have a mystical Jewish background to really contemplate the connection and parallels with the Kabbalah, which emerged in southern France in written form at the same time that this text was said to have been translated from Greek into Occitan. So there's a whole fascinating discussion that in that vein. I really would love to encourage you as part of the restoration of the world and as part of the restoration of Mary Magdalene, tomorrow is her feast day. And I would so encourage you to share this book, this story, the story of Mary Magdalene's reemergence. Maybe watch the film from 2000, that from two years ago, the Mary Magdalene film. It's flawed, but it is a, a, a closer depiction to the faithful witness and student than earlier Hollywood depictions have been. And, um, and to consider joining Ubiquity, uh, for Madonna Rising that will be coming up in August when um, Anne Baring and Banaf Sheh Sayad and Peggy Rubin and Ruth Cunningham and I will all be talking and I know there's gonna be a Magdalene piece there. And then immediately following that, August 23rd through 29th, 
We're going to walk in the footsteps of Mary Magdalene in Provence, and you're going to really discover that phrase of her as the mother. She is the mother of the mystical Christian tradition, and I will take you from amazing place to amazing place to see how this is so and that how these images of her, these, these images that are coming to light again after having been lost for so many, many centuries that we are so lucky that from he, now that we'll be able to trace that. So uh, this is the image that I wanna leave you with on the eve of Mary Magdalene's feast day. Mary Magdalene as the figure of towering, towering spiritual authority holding the jar of healing balm at her heart. And as she extends her arm of welcome underneath her cloak of compassion are the centuries of saints, Hildegard of Bingen, Catherine of Siena, Francis of Assisi, Saint Benedict, on and on and on and on. And just as we have desecrated the earth, our mother, and need to turn our attention to reverencing her, so too in the Christian tradition, we need to turn and honor this towering figure of spiritual wisdom. And tomorrow might be the first great step if we do that together. Beautiful, Kayleen, beautiful, beautiful. What an extraordinary privilege, everyone, to be honored by Kayleen bringing Mary Magdalene to us. It's just, it's just precious, just totally precious. Thank you, everyone. Remember tomorrow, the feast day of Mary Magdalene, and then we'll see you in one month's time, the second Tuesday of uh, August, uh, for the conclusion of the uh, Gospel of the Beloved Companion. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Kayleen. Thank, Thank you. you so much.